I love it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're getting there. Close, it's early. Close, close. I know, it's early. That's all right. We'll get there. Good morning for those of you joining us online as well. We are so glad that you are here with us in worship at Anona. Now, if you're new with us, if you've not been here before, and you'd like to learn a little bit more about who we are, we would love to get to know you as well. So if you're here in person in worship, don't hesitate to, to see Richard or myself or Casey or any of our staff here. We'd love to tell you a little bit more about the church. And if you're online, don't hesitate to reach out in the chat room. We've got a great chat space. You can reach out to one of our volunteers who will say hi and connect you to the life of the church. That is true. And it is a wonderful day to be in worship, is it not? It is. All right. We have a wonderful guest as well. This is Miss Emily. Emily, you want to stand up for a moment? We don't normally do this, but Emily is our district superintendent, otherwise known as our boss. Our boss is here. She's so our boss. Nice. So we love having <laughs> Emily here. She's going to be with the fast crowd this morning, doing a wonderful conversation with them. So I know that this is going to be an exciting time for them. And I've already had some of y'all approach me to say, do you know the district superintendent's going to be here? And yes, I know. <laughs> All right. That said, United Methodist Women... They don't exist anymore with that name. They're now called United Women in Faith. So if you're ever looking for UMW, they're now called United Women in Faith. There you go. Right. And they have their nut sale. So the Don't name has changed, but they're still nuts. All so right. make sure you go after the worship service. No comment. No comment. No comment. <laughs> go after the worship service down to the marketplace. Sign up, get your form filled out, get your nuts for the year, supply for the whole year because whatever they do in terms of their nut collections, they actually use that all towards missions. It's a great thing that they do. Absolutely. Now, we've got an exciting challenge out to us this year from our family ministry department. They are giving us the Give Us 10 campaign. Now, what is the Give Us 10 campaign? They are challenging us to be willing to give in a year 10 hours or 10 Sundays of one hour each of volunteer work, somewhere where you can help make the difference in the lives of our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our, our, our programs we have during the week or the season there, whether it's in tech or whether it's in volunteering, whatever it may be, we are looking for some people to step up. We would love for you to join us in that challenge of give us 10 for 20, well, I don't know, does that count for 2022? Would it be give us five since we're halfway through? That oh, run, okay. that was great, 2022. All right, it'll still be 10. Halfway through, you're like a poet. Yeah, I have no It's idea. a beautiful thing. So, so turn to your neighbor, give him 10. Give him 10. Well, all right. Uh, there I'm we gonna, go. My hand's full. Yeah. Right, thank you. Forward. A few of you did that. Give 10, guys. It really will help make a difference for the ministry of the church. We also have a new group that's starting up. It's called Grief Share. Um, so if you've gone through a loss or if you know somebody that has gone through the loss of somebody that they love, on September 12th, we're going to start doing gatherings. Um, so it's going to run for 14 weeks. So it runs pretty much almost up through Christmas. But it's a great way to get connected with a group that walks through that together as one. So if you're interested in that, make sure you get on the website. You can sign up ahead of time to let the facilitators know who's going to be there. And last but not least, we have an exciting new worship group starting this year, our Intergenerational Choir. So if you have every, that's right, we are excited about this one. Let me tell you, the choir is excited. If you have uh, children third grade and up, this is for adults, this is for youth, this is for our older grade school, but we are coming together with an exciting new choir uh, to do some new music in our worship service here. Nate is, where are you, Nate? There you are. Nate is spearheading this, and Nate, 9-6, is that a Tuesday night? Tuesday at what time? Six o'clock. So on September 6th, six o'clock, we hope this is a great, if you've got grandkids, you can have grandparents and grandkids singing together. It's the coolest thing. So hope that you check it out and be a part of this new exciting group. Let's worship. All right.
please remain standing and share along with me the affirmation from 1 Timothy this morning. I'll start us off. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. seated. And good morning. I'm Dave Rogers. I'm a Stephen minister. Personal problems can appear overnight or take years to gain focus. We make some of those problems. Others are just dumped on us by somebody else. Stephen ministers will be there with you when you're ready to talk about an issue that has grown bigger than you. Call the church and leave a private message in the Stephen ministry voice mailbox will return your call promptly. Prayer quilts offer comfort to those who would like the healing power of prayer wrapped around them. As you tie a knot into each quilt, please pray for the people receiving the quilts. If you'd like a quilt for yourself or somebody you know, just call the church. Please also pray for the people whom we know are in our hospitals today as well as those who have recently been discharged. It says none that we know of, but there's always a few, aren't there? Stephen ministers are in daily contact with the inpatients as well as their families. Let us know if you or a loved one are heading to the hospital. We'll come see you. Please also pray for the families who have recently lost loved ones. For a list of the Anona people who have died recently, please check the In Memoriam section of the Anona.com website. Again, please pray for the families who grieve. Now let's pray. Holy God, tomorrow the United States re-enters the lunar space race, picking up where we left off 50 years ago. The astonishing Artemis rocket is scheduled for liftoff on a path to the moon, and we are again excited. Thank you for this chance to freely mix our daily routines with your infinite cosmos. We're like children toting our finger paints into the places where only you dwell. This is your realm, Lord, and we are momentarily along for the wonderful ride and the astounding view. Thank you, God, for finding ways that encourage us to continue exploring your wider realm. We recall Earthrise, that first photo taken by an astronaut with the moon in the foreground while looking back at Earth. It was so beautiful. It allowed us for a moment to feel both consequential and yet so small, as your children would feel. The Postal Service soon took that photo and turned it into a stamp that read simply, In the beginning, God. That photo reminded us so poignantly that we are all your children. No matter where we live, no matter our circumstances, wherever we dwell on the blue and green marble, you dwell among us and in us. Oh God, You have given us everything. 
You have given us a world and an environment that lacks nothing. It's all here. All the food, all the water, all the air that any people from anywhere could ever want. The issues only arise when we are asked to divide it up fairly among ourselves. But tomorrow's launch of the Artemis Project does perhaps show that our abiding fairness issues are in some ways being addressed. Fifty years ago, the vast room housing mission control held 400 men and one woman. Tomorrow, mission control will be led by a woman, overseeing hundreds of men and women. And they will be from different racial backgrounds. Thank you, Lord, for your patience. Let your opportunities abound so that we might act on them. Please remind those who are not in this room now just how much we love them and how we pray for their safe return to us. Our soldiers, sailors, and Marines around the world, our loved ones hospitalized, institutionalized, or incarcerated, we pray for them all. So too we pray for our working heroes now on duty or preparing for work. They all touch our lives and we are grateful to them. For all of those in our hearts and in these prayers, we say together now the prayer Jesus the Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And now it's time for our offertory moment. And we want to lift up two special things going on in the life of your church this week. Number one, the opportunity to be a mentor. This is an awesome opportunity for us to really partner with the local schools. It's back to school season, and there are two places where we're seeking people to make a difference. It's our Panther Pals reading program, where you get to read to children, and then our Lunch Pals, where you literally just go and you sit and have lunch with kids during the school week and check on them. How are things going? How are you doing? It's a great relational connection to our community, to our children, and to our schools as well. Now, if you want to participate, sign up online actually today because the training luncheon is this week. We're just so excited that we have these kind of opportunities in the lives of our local schools. Second is helping our environment. We have our beach cleanup scheduled for Saturday, September 10th, 9 o'clock a.m. We're going to be gathering down right across off the Indian Rocks Beach access there across the street from Guppies. So if you can find the, the Guppies restaurant, it's that access point right across the street. There'll be a team out there helping to make a difference on our local beaches. Uh, and it is thanks to you, to your ties, your offerings, your volunteering of your support and your energy and your ability to help us make a difference, not only in this church, but in our community and beyond. So we're going to invite our ushers to come forward at this time for a prayer as we take our offering. Let's pray. God, we are blessed to be a blessing, and uh, we take just a moment to thank those who pour out in your name from the volunteers that work with children and youth, that teach adult classes, that sing in choirs, that volunteer with Panther Pals and reading programs, uh, that sew each week for special prayer quilts and just a myriad of other ways. Lord, we're thankful for the gifts and talents that people share. 
And now it's our opportunity and our joy to give a tithe back to you that we give from our savings, from our offerings to help make a difference in your name. Bless this, bless the givers alike as we continue to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world today. We pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
some people may think, oh, I need to know more about the Bible before I can take a discipleship class. That is totally not true. Okay. What better way to learn the Bible than the history of it as well? Is with other people coming from many different backgrounds. We were part of a Sunday school class called the Young Parents. <laughs> It's love. Yeah, it was love in action. That's what church is. Right. Disciple. This is the it's called disciple for a reason, right? So it's uh, that you are a disciple and that you come to a place where you make disciples. Who, what's the church that you would want Anona to be? This is it. This is it. A church with people filled with a desire for reading scripture. Right. Doing that together, um, doing life together. And it's the things that you've always heard about worship, grow, serve. Good morning, everybody. I have to say, were they not incredible? That was awesome. And Sherrod, Sherrod is now up there, so it's lovely to see you up there on the harp as well, so nothing but beautiful. In the video, um, I did hear, Jerry, you laugh when Pat said we were a part of the young parents class. <laughs> That was awesome, awesome. And we are starting a new study. We're uh, tying in the sermon series to what a group is doing within the church, which is doing what's called Disciple Fast Track. And so for the next six weeks, we're going to be going through some elements of the Old Testament together on a journey with that class. And today we're talking about the rebel people. That's you, right? Right, the rebel people. And, and I want to open up with a question. The question is this, what is wrong with the world? Anybody? Anybody got the answer? What's wrong with the world? Because I, I was thinking like, you know, if you thought about what's wrong with the world, a lot of things might come to mind. You might think um, maybe it's the, the, the leaders, right? Leaders of organizations, of companies, things like that. You might think it's the schools, that the schools aren't doing their job. You might think that it's the parties in the political system or the politicians in the political system. You might think that it's the media. There's just so many places that we can point and say that the thing that is wrong with the world are these things. And yet, I went back and I was like looking at, at G.K. Chesterton. And he was asked to write a essay. So a British paper reached out to him to say, hey, will you write an essay to answer that question? What is wrong with the world? And he did, he wrote an entire essay. The essay was two sentences long. And the first sentence was just repeating the question, what is wrong with the world? His response was two letters. The second sentence was two letters. The thing that is wrong with the world is me, me. I thought, what a powerful statement for him to put. For us to be able to claim me. Lynn and I, a few years ago, we were out in California, and uh, we were getting ready to fly back. We've been on vacation. We get to the airport. It's after, you know, it's post 9-11, so we had Ubered in, or Ubered in, right? Got in our car, went in, got to the airport hours ahead of time, so you can go through this fun thing called the security check line, if anybody's been through that. It's a place of joy and happiness where people are sharing wonderfully with one another. And so you go through this line and you get scans done and you come through and we're all ready. We go over to Dunkin' Donuts to get our healthy breakfast. And then we go to the airplane, we go to the gate. As we walk up to the gate, we get there and what do we see? The same thing you would normally see, right? Your plane's sitting there at the gate waiting for you, way ahead of time. What else did we see? We saw a bunch of people scrambling on one wing of the aircraft, and the engine exposed. And we found out that the aircraft was going to be delayed in its takeoff, and we were wondering why. What is wrong with the airplane? And as we sat there for hours, we were delayed over and over again, you realize that there was a problem with the engine. It was broken. And the reality is, guys, that's us. We're broken. And sometimes we don't even realize that we're broken. And yet people can look at us and say, right out the window at the gate, they can look at us and realize, Richard, there's something wrong with him. There's something that's messed up about him. 
that maybe I don't even see. And what we're trying to get at today, what I think the scripture's getting at today is the same thing that Chesterton was talking about with that two-letter statement, me. What is wrong with the world, me? And he didn't just reveal the problem in that moment. He didn't just reveal that he was broken, that we are broken. He began to reveal the solution. And so we're gonna turn to Psalm 51 today to look at what I consider to be one of the keys to solving the problem of our brokenness. And here's what it says. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you were justified in your sentence, blameless, blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in my inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me, O God, a clean heart and put a new and right spirit within me. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. What I didn't include in that scripture reading is something that's important because the entirety of Psalm 51 is written by a person that you're familiar with from the Old Testament. His name is David, King David. And if you were to read the Hebrew Bible, you would find that the opening part that I'm about to read, they actually have his verses in their Bible. So theirs doesn't open up with have mercy on me, on God, O God. What theirs says in verses one and two is this. To the leader a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. That's the opening in the Hebrew Bible. And that's the context for the words that are spoken in this moment, which means that these, these words aren't just words of David. They're words of David written at a specific moment, a moment where he'd fallen and he had to have somebody come along to point out to him, you fell. This is the moment, this is the moment when, when he answered the question, what is wrong with the world with me? I'm the problem. Against you alone, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And guys, when we read scripture, we're meant to put ourselves in the story. We're meant to substitute ourselves, to be able to look at ourselves and say, I'm gonna play the role of David. I'm gonna play the role of, of the person that is going through the story. And so you might put yourself in the story of the garden. You might put yourself as Adam or Eve and realize that's you. You're the one, you're the one who's told not to take the fruit and does it anyway. And now you've got the fruit in your hand and you take the bite. And as you take the bite, your eyes are open up to something that you wish you'd never seen. And now suddenly you hear, you hear, not Adam and Eve hears, you hear God approaching. You're meant to put yourselves in the place of Judas. Judas, who, who's walked with Jesus for three years made friends with all the other disciples, walked the journey together as one, and now here comes this moment where you're gonna go around and sit at a table, and as you're sitting at the table, you know, you know what you're gonna do, and you still do it. You still do it. We are supposed to put ourselves in the place of Israel. Israel's story where 
we're constantly over and over, the whole story going through this whole Old Testament is pointing to Jesus Christ because Israel, which is supposed to be a light to the nations, which is supposed to be the ones that go out and show what it means to be people that are faithful and follow God, that seek to be obedient to God, and instead fall and fall and fall and fall again. We're supposed to be able to see ourselves in that light. And today, we're supposed to see ourselves in David's light. We're supposed to be able to realize the moment when here he is standing in his palace. He sent the army off to war rather than going to be at war with his forces. He has stayed behind. He walks up onto the roof. He looks out across Jerusalem, and he sees Bathsheba. And he doesn't stop there, and we don't either. So many times, the thing that we look at, the thing that draws us in, we end up doing just like David, just like Judas, just like Adam, just like Eve. The cool thing is, that's not the end of the story. We're meant to put ourselves in there, right? So that we can say those words that we're all familiar with. There, but by the grace of God, go I. And yet we don't like to say those words. We don't like to own the thing that we do that causes us to be distanced from one another, that causes us to be distanced from God. It's not fun to admit things. It's not fun to be able to articulate the words that that David articulates right here. But what we don't realize is that our breaking point, the point at which which we become broken and separated from God can become the greatest moment of our lives because our breaking point can be the point where God turns it into a turning point. That's why this particular psalm, for me, is both humanity at its worst, David admitting having to be told to admit, Nathan having, the prophet Nathan, having to come to him and saying, you're the man, you're the one, that's the worst. But getting to the best of being able to say, I can confess, I can own the thing that I did. How many of you have um, memorized, I won't put you on that, that question, many of you have memorized, right, the fruits of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There we go. We memorize those. And it's good that we memorize those because a lot of times what we do when we get our, our verses and we have favorite verses, you'll notice that they tend to be very positive. Yes? What we don't do, what we don't do is understand those particular verses in context because... We teach those to our kids, right? So if you thought of of our youth group, if you thought of our children's ministry, we help them to learn love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We turn it into a song. The fruit of the Spirit is not an orange, right? The fruit of the Spirit is not a banana. And then they go through and they learn. Remember when we used to do that? You want to sing it for us, Susan? No, right? So we used to sing this song in order to help them to learn what the fruits of the Spirit are. Are. However, what we tend to do as individuals and as a community is leave out a key word from that verse. Because if you look at the opening to that verse, it doesn't say the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self control. There's no law against such things. It opens with but. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, right? Or in my version, it says by contrast. And whenever you get the by contrast or you get the but, that means you got to back up. You got to back your butt up, all right? You got to get back into the scripture and say, in contrast to what? In contrast to what? In order to get the power of what this says, we have to go back a little bit. I'm just going to go back a few verses. This is verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh, not the spirit, are obvious. 
fornication, impurity, licentiousness. Aren't these fun words? Idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. I am warning you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Anybody have that for your memory verse? No. What, what David's giving a gift here for us to be able to do is saying between those two places, between the place that Paul is talking about here with all those ugly words and the place where you get to the fruit of the spirit, so the flesh versus the spirit, in between these two places, how do we transition? Psalm 51. Psalm 51. We confess. We look at ourselves with integrity and honesty and say, I blew it, and I blow it all the time. And one of the best things, one of the best things is the fact that, that in doing that, what you need to realize is you're not the first mover. You're not the one that's acting first. The good news is that God moves first. Will Willimon put it like this. All of our lives are lived in the light of a prior choice. All of our lives. Everything that we do is lived in light of a prior choice. And he goes on to say that prior choice, that's not your decision. That's not your choice. It's God's choice. So when you think about Adam and Eve and how they took the fruit and they did the thing and they were supposed to die, they did not die. God's prior choice was that they would live. Instead, what does he do? He provides them with clothes. If you think about it from the perspective of King David, he didn't lose his reign in spite of the fact that he slept with Bathsheba. He sent her husband to the front lines and said, hey, when you get out there, army, pull back, leave him alone so he gets killed. God is for us in ways that maybe we can't even imagine. And that's in spite of the fact that David did two of the worst of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. So can we realize that whatever it is that you or I have done, whatever mistakes we've made, whatever words we've said, that before we even start, God is for us. Alan Hirsch put it like this, God's acceptance precedes our repentance. God's acceptance precedes our repentance. God moves first and the question becomes, how will we respond? How will we respond? Will we respond at all might be one question. Will we respond in a way that says forget you might be another response. Or will we take Paul's statement, I'm sorry, David's statement, and get to the place where we're able to confess. Guys, we are meant to fly. We might have an engine out on the wing, but we're meant to fly. I I was, uh, a few weeks ago, I was walking the campus, and I went over to uh, Wesley Hall area. And as I was walking into the Wesley Hall area, kids were pouring out. So the, the preschool kids were pouring out from their classrooms. And because there was potential for lightning, there was lightning things, you know, we have little monitors that say it's within the zone. We don't let the kids go outside. That's probably a good idea, right? All right, so they were gonna play instead inside of the Contemporary Worship Center. And they went in there and I followed behind them. The next thing you know, they're running around and around, and their teachers are just watching them run around. And for just a moment, for just a moment, I got to just be with the kids. I was able to shed all the stuff, all the the stuff that is in me, the fears of what I might look like, the things that I was dealing with on that particular day, the things I might have said wrong or done wrong, and for just a moment, I got to fly. 
And so I jumped into the running and I threw my arms out and I started flapping like this. And I didn't have these beautiful black wings at the moment, but I was flapping. And all of a sudden, all the kids are coming in behind me. Almost all the kids are coming in behind me. Some of them were coming right at me. And we started to fly together. Isaiah 40, 31 says this. Those who wait or those who hope or those who trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. God wants us to fly. And God is the first mover before you even know that you need God. You are forgiven. And all you got to do is get to this place. All you got to do, it sounds simple, and I know it's hard. It's hard for me to be able to put your hands up and say, what is wrong with the world? And start with the one area that you have control to change. And you put your hand up and say, me. I am wrong with the world. I'm part of the problem. And somehow when we own it, when we give it to God, suddenly we might find ourselves with things coming out of us that are a little bit different, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God's inviting us into that, guys. I want to close, actually, and let this be our prayer. Psalm 51, and I'm going to encourage you to do the same thing. Maybe take the week, put a little marker in your Bible. Psalms is about halfway through. Just open up. Psalm 51, and maybe have a thing about you, not somebody else, that you want to confess. And then pray this prayer. Let's pray. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions. And God, my sin is always right there before me, before my eyes. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. God, you're justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment on me. I was born guilty, a sinner. God, you desire truth in my inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. And let the bones that have been crushed rejoice. God, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities and create in me a clean heart and put a new and right spirit within me. Amen.
Where does it begin? With me. With me. With you. With us. St. Ignatius, who was the founder of the Order of Jesuits, had two questions in his exam that I think are important that we can ask every day. One, where did I work with Jesus? And two, where did I resist? Both of those are great questions. We can confess and know God's got us. Amen? Let's walk that way.